I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Vet Lloyd tonight. Dr. Lloyd is a national expert on ticks and tick-borne diseases and is the head of the Mount Allison University Tick Lab. For the past decade, her lab has been working on the genetics of ticks and the pathogens that they transmit. Dr. Lloyd is committed to incorporating the community and Lyme disease patients as full partners in research to tackle the biological, social, and human dimensions of zoonotic diseases. Tonight, we are going to learn more about ticks, their identification and prevalence, tick-borne diseases, protection from tick bites, and more about current tick research. So if you have any questions for Dr. Lloyd, please type them into the chat and uh, she can deal with those following her presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Vet Lloyd and I'm going to turn the camera and the microphone over to you now, Vet. Okay, thank you very much. And thank, me thank you all for the opportunity to chat about my favorite tub subject, which is eight-legged crawly little bags of pathogen transmitting creatures. I mean, who could not want to hear about ticks in the evening? Um, I, I'm sorry that we're not doing this in person. I remember talking to your group in person a few years ago, and it was a lovely opportunity. But now, uh, thanks to the wizardry of the internet, we'll do this online. So let's see how this goes. Is that showing up? Yes, it is. Lovely. Okay. Um, so I appreciate the chat chance to chat with people about ticks. You might think that as uh, our sort of slightly damp summer, interrupted by the occasional forest fire and a whole lot of rain, is winding down, that the ticks would be calming down. In fact, they're heading into their peak season because ticks like cold and wet. Uh, the cool is happening and the wet certainly has been on tap pretty much most of the summer. So here's a lovely bit of trail in the St. John region. Uh, there are so many beautiful areas in your neck of the woods. Um, if you're out going outside, absolutely essential to do that uh, for your physical health, mental health. I'm outside every time I can get. But as uh, the St. John area is the province's major hotspot and the second place to have an established tick population, as far as we know, you might as well know if you're bringing back some of the beautiful outside, but not quite so beautiful and it can cause diseases. So uh, basically ticks, why you want them to socially distance from you and what to do if they don't. Uh, so this is a bit flippant tick and you don't want it ending up inside of you, sticking their little mouth parts, which are like a harpoon and it works very much like a harpoon you don't really want that to happen. Now, if ticks were fully compliant with public health directives and put on their little masks, wouldn't be a problem. But unfortunately, they break the rules. So uh, what are you going to do to protect yourself, your, your family, and your community? Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about ticks. I'm going to tell you about the pathogens they carry because the idea is it, knowledge is power and knowledge will protect you and those around you. And then we're going to focus into the really practical things, what clothing you can wear, how to detect ticks. And that's what my dog feels about it. Fortunately, they're going to perk up occasionally. So we'll start with a mini lecture on ticks. Sorry, don't worry too bad, or too much. It's not that bad. So we all know there are lots of things that like our blood. Anyone who's been outside at all this summer knows that it was also a great year for mosquitoes. And worldwide, mosquitoes cause more diseases than anything else. And that's just because there's so many ticks. I know, or so many mosquitoes, I'm sorry. I know they don't all live in my backyard, but it just, it really felt like that this summer. However, uh, where ticks come into their own is they can transmit more disease causing microbes than any other organism. They carry viruses, they carry parasites, they carry worms, they carry bacteria. 
if it can if it's nasty when injected into your body a tick can probably manage to get it in there all right so for in a slightly larger context uh moving away from my backyard and your backyard to the world okay so we're zooming out in a major way um in North America, Lyme disease infections, which is the most common infection transmitted by ticks, is actually six times more frequent than HIV infections. So that's a lot of people getting sick. And if we think about the global response to HIV infections, we're going to have to get on board and do have a global response to ticks and tick-borne diseases. The reason for that is that in a recent study of how many people are or have been infected by the Lyme disease causing bacteria <clears throat> came up with a average um, prevalence of 14%. So basically one in every seven people. Now that was probably biased by looking at people who are occupationally exposed. So if you uh, have a job that takes you outside a lot but that also includes people who are outdoors a lot recreationally. So it's certainly out there. That's not as bad as the prevalence. That's a Europe, also skewed by European prevalence. They've been dealing it with, for a long, with the diseases for a long time, as they have in the United States. But, you know, Canada's doing its very best to catch up. So this is what's happening in New Brunswick. I started the collecting ticks and we started the tick lab, lab in 2012. Why we started that, I was running a sort of uh, a, a small cancer lab working on how, why cells went bad and started becoming cancerous. And then I was out gardening, which is my favorite activity. Tick found me. I got Lyme disease. When I recovered my health, I thought I could probably contribute a lot to the health of New Brunswickers by working on ticks. So this is where this is where we found ticks in 2012. And this lovely map was prepared by Service New Brunswick. So thank you to them. Uh, 2013 was actually quite an extreme year. So it knocked the ticks back a bit. But don't worry, they came back. And incidentally, that big red blob sitting over St. John, well, that would be tick central 2015 yet more 2017 more and more so you're getting the idea is that the ticks are moving in in response to climate change as well as other factors but in the last decade you say cli so climate change has really been driving the fact that the ticks that come in are able to survive and uh, may seem not overly romantic, but one tick finds another tick. Uh, they make little ticky love. And then the female, if she gets a good blood meal, will lay two to 3,000 eggs. That means that one tick or two ticks can make a lot of babies really quickly. So they've been taking off. All right. So I alluded to the life cycle. We're going to go do this quickly. Uh, ticks are hardy beasts. They can actually survive several years. They routinely do, two to three years. When it gets cold, they just crawl into the leaf litter or maybe a couple centimeters below ground, and they just hang out till it warms up. The life cycle is straightforward. They start little, they get bigger. They need a blood meal to transition between each of these stages. And I mentioned the female tick laying uh, several thousand eggs. That's what's shown on the top right-hand corner. One female, she got a lovely drink of blood and she basically falls off her host and lays egg after egg after egg after egg. You get the idea. Some gratuitous pictures of ticks because why not? Uh, one on the top is a female. She's fully engorged. The one on the bottom is a male. Um, they tend to be smaller because they don't have to make those 3,000 eggs. Um, not much else to say about that. Here's a female where we knocked the head off accidentally. The eggs are, her body basically becomes filled up with eggs. And in this case, when we knock the head off, they sort of fired out under pressure at which point we decided to clean the lab thoroughly. 
so that's the life cycle. Let's talk about when the ticks find you. Um, no, we're not. We're going to ignore that. So the tick will... A day in the life of the tick is actually pretty boring. It hangs out in the winter, slightly underground, in the warmer weather, slightly above ground. When it gets really hot, it goes under, slightly underground, again, just to keep its water in and not desiccate. So when it gets warm enough to move, it slowly crawls up a blade of grass. Climb, 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 climb. Hangs on with the back feet. It's got eight feet. It's got lots of legs for climbing. Shoves the front feet out. Uh, the tick version of the nose is at the tip of the front feet. Their anatomy is kind of weird by our, by our standards. And they gently, gently wave their front feet around. They're smelling the air. This behavior is called questing. It's if the word questing makes you think of knight in shining armor and damsel in distress and great excitement. Uh, it's not that exciting. Basically, they wave their arms around in the air. And if they don't smell anything, they at the end of the day, they go back down their blade of grass and repeat. And repeat and repeat. They are pernicious creatures. They can last a year, sometimes more, if they don't get food. So fortunately, they don't appear to be much into mental stimulation. If they do smell something and they're smelling uh, the carbon dioxide you produce as you breathe or any animal produces as it breathes and any of the odors that your body puts out, if you are considerate enough to brush by them, they're going to grab onto you with their legs and they are going to very, very slowly crawl along your body. They crawl slowly enough that they're not tickling the hairs, so you don't really feel them walking along you. The other thing they're doing is, left to their own devices, they're going to feed for anywhere three to seven days. So they don't want to be interrupted. They're slow feeders. They just want a nice, quiet spot. So they're going to search for a dark and damp crevice in your body. This becomes important where I describe when you're where you should be looking for the ticks that are hitchhiking on you. They also don't want to feel they don't want you to feel them biting you. So as they shove their harpoon like mouth parts into you, they squirt out squirt out an anesthetic so you don't feel it. Then in that little panel, the top right hand corner, they shove their mouth parts into your blood and they're slowly sipping your blood through a straw like mouth parts. They're going to keep doing that, which is actually fine. It's only revolting, but them taking your blood isn't a problem unless there are thousands of ticks, at which point they could actually remove enough blood that you feel it. That's a problem for moose with the moose ticks and some rabbits with rabbit ticks where, where there are just thousands of them. But for us, one or two ticks wouldn't be a problem for them taking blood. The problem is that Blood is mostly water. They don't want to squirt the water out their back. They can't use the water and they can't leak it out because then you'd notice a big damp patch and deal with it. So they squirt the water back into you. So we end up being food and a sewer system for the tick. And as they're squirting the water from our own blood back into us, it picks up all the bacteria and the viruses and the uh, nematode worms and the other parasites and they get squir squirted into our bloodstream and that's the real problem with ticks okay so now that i've made everyone contemplate the wisdom of eating before this talk uh the ticks we're going to encounter that are most that are not picky about what they eat they're generalist feeders so they'll take a human just as happily as anything else, are the black-legged tick, which someone always points out, yeah, shouldn't they have black legs? Yes, they should. It annoys me a great deal. Uh, their legs are dark brown, but they're not black. And they're not necessarily this sort of pumpkin orange always. You have a dog tick, which is a bigger version with a decorative back. 
And you have a groundhog tick, which is sort of the blonde cousin of the black-legged tick. Those are the guys that are most often found on humans. So how do we get the ticks here? Uh, the ticks come in on long distance on migratory birds, such as uh, this bird shown at the top that has a nice fully engorged tick sitting behind its eye. Birds are good at preening, but they can't necessarily do their heads because the beak doesn't reach around there. So that's where the ticks will latch on and that they will carry them long distances. Essentially, migratory birds are the ticks answer to Air Canada, except they get food when they travel on a bird. Once the, the bird lands, the tick will drop off fully fed and then it can move on a mouse or any other small or large mammal. That's a mouse with a tick on it. So then they will just slowly disperse in the local environment. And if the winters permit the ticks to survive, then we'll get more and more ticks. Now, the idea of the way they spread infection is that not every tick has an infection. And at least for the Lyme disease bacteria, they're not born with the infection. So the way they pick up the infection is by feeding on an infected mammal. And how do you get an infected mammal? It starts with one infected tick that's shown on the left. That little red blob, show, blob shows the Lyme disease bacteria. That's brought in, say, on a migratory bird. That tick will feed on wildlife, say a local shrew. They particularly love shrews, but you no, know, deer mice, meadow voles. They're not picky, birds, anything. Once those rodents and local animals are infected, any other ticks feeding on them will become infected. And when those ticks feed on people, pets, other wildlife, they will become infected too. So this is an escalating cycle with more wildlife becoming infected and more ticks becoming infected because there's more wildlife to give them the infection. And that, unfortunately, is what's happening in New Brunswick. Practical things. Where are you going to encounter ticks? Well, the Canadian Maritimes are good. You'll find ticks and infected ticks wherever you find mice, and you find mice pretty much everywhere. They're particularly partial to forest, long grass, and broken forest, which largely describes what, hap the, what happens in the Maritimes. When do you find ticks? Um, they will be actively looking for food whenever it's above freezing. They get quite frisky around four. They really do like the cooler temperatures. The highest risk is in the spring and the fall, but I show a picture of a warm water seep there uh, because even in the dead of winter, there are some areas where the groundwater will bubble to the surface. The wildlife really particularly likes that for drinking, and you're going to find a high density of ticks around there. So for the most part, when they're covered up by snow, it's fairly safe, but there is no 100% safe time. All right, so that's covered the ticks. I've mentioned the fact that ticks are nasty because they give us disease-causing microbes. These are pathogens. So there are a lot of them that are transmitted by ticks. Of the very many pathogens they transmit, we worry about the Lyme disease bacteria the most because it's the most common. And between the tick bite itself and the tick saliva and the Lyme disease bacteria, they both cause an immune suppression, which means that any other microbes in the tick even if a healthy person could normally throw off that infection, their immune system could deal with it because the tick and the Lyme disease bacteria are suppressing their immune system, other infections can take hold. So there are a variety of them and I won't go through them to save time. I'm gonna focus on Lyme disease because it's the big player in the field of tick-borne disease, good for it. So what do we find in New Brunswick? Uh, we find 
The first three bars, the sort of rosy red ones, are the Lyme disease bacteria. Like every other critter, it comes in different species. So we have the major species, uh, which is the classical Lyme disease, but we have other Lyme disease species in there. Doesn't really matter. They'll all make you sick. One thing that does matter is that our tests, the blood tests for Lyme disease, are mostly looking for one type, one species of Lyme disease, uh, and it won't necessarily work for the other types of Lyme disease. We're also starting to see a huge amount of a parasite that's related to the malaria agent. So it's a protist parasite. It's a toughie, lives in our red blood cells, make, can make people very ill. We don't fully know what it does to humans, but there's a lot of it around. So that's an ongoing concern. We find some, we're starting to see anaplasma, which bursts your red blood cells. That's kind of nasty. That's coming up in New Brunswick and as well as some of the viruses. Okay, so with that cheery note, let's talk a little bit about the Lyme disease bacteria. Let's, yes, don't know why my computer's doing that. It's a, uh, as bacteria go, it's considered exciting and pretty. Um, clearly microbiologists, like many scientists, spend way too much time looking into the microscope if we worry about which bacteria is the prettiest. But it's instead of being a round blob or a elongated blob, it's a spirally shaped form, at least sometimes. So that means it's called a spirochete because it's spiral shaped. Yeah, aren't we clever? Uh, it isn't always spiral shaped. If it runs out of food or if the conditions are hostile, such as you taking antibiotics, it'll curl up into the little balls that are shown on the right. And these spherical round structures are, again, an amazing display of creativity in the scientific community. Those round bodies are called round bodies. Someone was really working overtime on creativity there. Uh, the problem with the round bodies is they're basically resting stages. They're just going to hang out. It's a highly protected state. And they hang out till you stop taking the antibodies. And then they stick their little heads out and they hatch. Not Well, the bacteria reform and you get the infection regrowing. So that is one of the challenges tends to be a slow growing bacteria. So you have to take longer antibiotic regimes than a simple sore throat or something else. Um, they're resist, they are antibiotic tolerant and they're also hard to detect. The picture down on the bottom shows a human nerve cell and the little green blobs are the bacteria, the, the Lyme disease bacteria. And that is another problem. Generally speaking, you don't want a ton of bacteria in your brain cells. And these guys really like our nerve cells. They like our nerve cells. They like our glia because it's a rich source of lipids, fats, basically, that they can use and grow with. But it's not great for us when they do that. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, there are different species the United States has done a really good job of mapping where you find the concentrations of the different species, showing a map of the US because we don't have an equivalent one for Canada. And this just reinforces the idea that um, the diagnostics are picking out the major species. But if we look at the New England state, in addition to the major species, which is on top there, the Borrelia burgdorferi, we have other ones that are present and they're not as readily detected. Okay, so we've talked about revolting ticks sipping your blood. At this point, it is actually quite normal to be feeling itchy. Then we've talked about the bacteria they cover. At this point, it's quite normal to start wondering, oh, I'm feeling achy, sick, horrible. All right, so let's talk about what we can do about it. 
because hiding inside and never going outside is not an answer. So ticks are here. They're not going to go away. The only way we could get rid of them would be to eliminate the outside world, and we're not going to do that. Um, so we need to adapt. People have been living with ticks for a very long time. Our neighbors to the south in the New England states are have had a serious tick problem for decades now, and they still go outside and they manage to deal with it. So we've got to, got to get on board with dealing with ticks. And it's a multi-step process. First idea is if you don't get bitten by a tick, you don't have to worry about getting sick. So prevention. Prevention is not 100%. So while it's great, it's not going to work 100% of the time. So your next best option is early detection and treatment. And if you catch it early, treatment is going to be very effective. Well, the next best step after that is catching it late. Treatment is more difficult, but still you're detecting it. And the worst outcome is if you don't find the tick and if you don't recognize the disease symptoms, if you don't have access to appropriate medical care, the diseases can escalate. And they become chronic, completely debilitating, and uh, can lead to death. So... Let's talk about prevention, because it's better than all of that. All right. Uh, this is ways to protect yourself. It's a rather wordy public health uh, notice, but I'm going to highlight the important things. Repellents work. Uh, DEET is the standard mosquito repellent. Uh, ticks are less fussy than mosquitoes, so they need more DEET, more frequently refreshed than mosquitoes to stay off. Uh, there's icaridin or picaridin. This is the active ingredient of black peppers. Uh, it works as well or better than DEET. Uh, if you buy a commercial spray that says it's got icaridin or picaridin, generally speaking, if they say it's good against ticks, it probably is, and it probably has icaridin. Okay. If you're really outdoors a lot, uh, you can have clothing treated with permethrin. It's now available in Canada uh, from Mark's Work Warehouse, or you can make your own, or you can buy it in the States. Uh, not going out into the nature in the skimpiest clothing ever is a good way to avoid tick bites, or at least make it tough for the ticks. I mean, why not give them a bit of a challenge? Some people will not tuck pants, legs into socks, but boots will work just as well if you want to be fashionable in the woods. And for your yard, you can do things by liking, making them less attractive to ticks, which is essentially by making your yard less attractive to mice. So going through those, uh, you can go for commercial products or natural products. For both, apply more frequently than they recommend for mosquitoes. Um, the not, the commercial products have always been tested. The natural products may or may not be tested. Uh, so you're doing the testing as you apply them. Uh, none are a hundred percent effective, but they're all better than nothing. If you are not human. So for all the dogs watching this, um, okay, well, mine have gone to sleep. They've heard it before. There are a variety of products that work really well for your pets. Uh, they are things you put on the back of your neck as your dog squiggles away, or they're edible products. That isn't my dog, but the maniac look of that is so good, I'm going to take it along with the fingers, is exactly how mine uh, re respond to the edible treats. Apparently, they're very tasty. I've not tried them myself. Uh, ditto for cats. You can also get a Lyme disease vaccine for your dog, not offered for cats. Cats can get Lyme disease, but um, it's not treated as aggressively. Clothing. Light colored clothing makes it easier to see something black going walking up your body. Uh, that does not mean you have to brush off your wedding gear and go walking into the forest in your bridal whites or your nice white John Travolta leisure suit. Um, 
khaki works just as well. And you can buy uh, permethrin treated clothing, or you can make your own uh, following instructions. Uh, the CanLime website is probably the best of the sources for instructions on DIY permethrin treated clothing. For protecting your yard, uh, there are various companies that spray your yard. They spray with various things. Most of them are sort of uh, natural analogs of permethrin. They're rough on spiders, so it's not ecologically wonderful, but it's better than having a severe tick infestation in your yard. If you let your child or your cat out into the backyard and they come back with ticks on them on a regular basis, you have a problem time to deal with it uh there are targeted anti-rodent approaches not only getting rid of the rodents but then trying to get rid of the ticks on the rodents through tick tubes uh tick tubes have cotton wool soaked with permethrin so the rodents go in they collect a bit of fuzz for their nest and it knocks the ticks off them it works pretty well uh you can make your own or you can purchase them in packs where they come in attractive camouflaged color um, because, of course, your rodents are very fashion conscious. As we all know, mice really care where they collect their bedding. So you can either stuff toilet, use, to use toilet uh, paper tubes and make your own or buy them. In the long term, I'm quite optimistic about trials being done in the States where they're vaccinating the rodents against Lyme disease. And the idea is that if the rodents cannot give the ticks Lyme disease, the ticks can't transmit it to us. And that way you don't have to worry about vaccine hesitancy. The vaccine's delivered in a food bait. Uh, the mice really don't care, food is food. And if they get side effects and get sick, oh well, they're wild mice, sucks to be them. Okay, so that's the prevention. What happens if all the repellents don't work? Your next bet, tick checks. Tick checks work, Chicks, tick, tick checks are essential. If you're in a high tick area, do it at least once a day, preferably twice, but when you come in, you and a friend or you and a nice mirror are able to look at for unusual black dots on your body. The black dots can look like a mole. The difference between a tick and a mole is the tick wasn't there the day before and the tick has legs and your mole doesn't. So if you find a freckle or a brand new mole with legs sticking out of it, that's a bad thing. Remove it. On so just before we get how to remove them, uh, I mentioned that the ticks like dark and damp. This is the top image is uh, one, a very sanitized, but one of my favorite public health pictures. Uh, you have a sphere on top of a sort of blob with four bits sticking out of it. That's supposed to be the human body. Yeah. So. If you are a tall individual, such as an adult, where you can find them are behind the knees, between the legs, belly button, uh, belt area that's often sweaty and creviced, under the arms. If you have folds of skin, ticks like them. If you are someone with breasts, the ticks may be under there. So those are the hot spots. If you are a short person, or if you're a gardener and you're on your hands and knees shoving your head into foliage, uh, in and around the hair and in and around the ears are also popular. Now, how do you see all of those bits? Well, the stuff on the front you can see, stuff on the back you can either see or feel, and for the cracks and crevices way down there, this tick smart image is from uh, public health in the US. <laughs> I quite like it. Uh, demonstrating step one, sit on a toilet. Step two, stare down there. Step three, is there a tick? Not shown step four, which would be screaming or uttering profanity. It's entirely your choice. Okay, so we're on to early detection and treatment. So you can find a tick. Now what? 
your basic idea is to get the tick off. You can go to emergency and ask them to take it off for you, but you're looking at a long wait. And the sooner that tick is off you, the better. So learning how to do it yourself makes some sense. If you have tweezers, that works. Grab the tick close to your skin, pull upwards slowly, smoothly. It looks disgusting. The good news is it won't hurt because of that anesthetic. There are special devices which will get the tick out for you if you're too squeamish to do it with uh, tweezers. They work too. Um, if you're in a pinch, uh, you have fingers on the ends of your hand. Usually they will do it. Just try not to squish the tick too much. Um, if you have open cuts on your hand, um, disinfect them or try not to use the hands and the fingers with open cuts. The uh, CDC very helpfully tells us not to use kerosene nail polish matches or petroleum jelly. The reason for this is, first of all, that as you suffocate the tick, it knows it's dying and it squirts all its, basically it vomits into you and that just gets more pathogens into your bloodstream. You don't want that. A more pragmatic reason is, I mean, how many people go walking in the woods with nail polish? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to put the answer in the chat. And perhaps the third reason, if you're going to use flammable material like kerosene, really, really don't apply a match to it afterwards. It will kill the tick. On the other hand, that's not going to be your problem right after you set the kerosene on your skin on fire. Uh, if you follow the CDC, they actually have a whole page explaining in detail why not to apply kerosene and then set it on fire. Okay, I mentioned that the tick needs to get off you as quickly as possible. Uh, there have been various uh, guidance about how long it takes a tick to transmit disease. There is no safe time. Used to be said to be 72 hours, then it was shortened to 48, then 36, then 24. It's actually a really complex process. It depends on how quickly the tick feeds, what the tick has in it, and what the tick was doing before it started sucking your blood. There's none of, you don't know any of that stuff, so just get it off you as quickly as possible and do a tick check at least once a day. All right. The most common kinds of ticks you're going to see are the black-legged ticks or the groundhog ticks. They look about the same unless you have a microscope tucked in with the nail polish in your pocket. Or the dog ticks. If you want to identify the tick yourself, the dog ticks are a little bit bigger and they have white speckles on their back. If you have to have a tick on you, that's the better one. Um, it is the black-legged ticks that carry the, transmit the Lyme disease, and that's really the problem. So you find a tick. If you wish to get it identified, you have a couple choices. There's the public health website called eTick. You take a picture of it, you send it to them. They'll, within 24 hours, send you an identification back, uh, along with some standard advice, public health advice. Uh, it doesn't tell you what's happening in your particular tick, just what is generally an issue with that species of ticks. Alternatively, you send me a picture and I'll tell you. Um, if you actually want to find out what is in your particular tick because that tick was on you and you're not keen about it or it was on someone you care about, you have to submit the tick for molecular testing so we figure out which pathogens were actually in that tick. We used to be able to do it for free. I'm very sorry, we can't do that for free anymore. We ran out of money. Then we actually got a big chunk of money from someone's estate who died from Lyme disease and they donated money for free tick testing for other people. And then we ran out of that. So now we have to make people pay for it. I'm sorry. So we... Uh, we've merged with a company called Genetix or Genetics, if you want to be trendy, and the website is genetics.ca. All right. The depressing scenario I'm going to skim over. If you don't prevent a tick bite, if you don't catch the tick early, things go downhill from there. Um, 
there it used there used to be the feeling that Lyme disease wasn't serious and you could get rid of it quickly. The modern the increasing amount of modern scientific work supports that it is actually a very complex uh, disease. Detection is tricky. It's a complicated bacteria and it's hard to deal with. I'm going to skip over what it does to you. Not everyone forms a rash. Some people get facial palsy. Some people get migratory arthritis. But if you let the infection run, which is what can happen if you don't catch the tick, the bacteria can invade every organ system of your body. And that's not good. The rash, this is the Wikipedia rash, doesn't always look like that. Here's public health from the US showing you a variety of exciting rashes. Excellent, what would you rather look at when you're in a doctor's office than pictures of ulcerating rashes and sores? Unfortunately, this is an actual real live rash. Sometimes they're not particularly interesting. And not everyone gets the classical bullseye rash. And in fact, not everyone gets a rash at all. And if you have pigmented skin, it's that much harder to see a rash. So don't rely on the rash. With that warning, I'm gonna stop so people can ask questions. I really, really want to emphasize that we need to be outside. It's important, it's beautiful, it restores the spirit, it keeps the body healthy. And we live in an amazingly beautiful province in a very beautiful country. So get outside, but do it sensibly. The same way that you wouldn't just walk up a mountain in your shorts without checking the weather. When you come home from being outside, do a tick check. It's easy, it's quick, and it can help preserve your life. So I'll end with a, well, because it's dessert time. This is a joke in Gorge Tick Scones. Uh, we won't have to go there. I'll stop sharing my screen. And if people want to ask me questions, I'd love to answer them. Why do we not have a good prophylactic or even vaccine in home we'll give our dogs or humans? <laughs> Very, very exciting. Why don't we have this? It's, in fact, my dogs were for me, I think. Were you able to hear that? Pat? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And one that comes up, um, the veterinary community has been quite aggressive in pursuing treatments and preventatives for Lyme disease. Uh, your dogs are generally shorter, hairier, and smellier than the human members of your family. And I say generally because I don't want to make any comments or aspersions about either your dogs or your family. Um, but usually uh, they're more at risk of getting a tick bite than a human. So veterinarians have been very active in pursuing preventative treatments. There is There was a vaccine for Lyme disease. Uh, it was withdrawn, long saga, doesn't matter because it's not here anymore. A new variation of that is being in clinical trials now. It, it's still going to be some years before it's available. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be for everyone. Really, I'm, I've got my hopes pinned on the vaccine that's given to wildlife to clear the bacteria out of the wildlife so that the ticks can't transmit it to us. Okay, another question in the chat. What is the fee to have the testing of a tick? And is the testing done in New Brunswick? They always thought it was done out west. Um, so the public health testing used to be done in uh, Manitoba, in Winnipeg. Uh, that's not available anymore unless there's a special program in your area. And a few target areas do get special programs. But if you're doing the commercial testing, uh, yes, it's done in New Brunswick. It's done in my lab. Um, the head office is Ontario because they've got a lot of ticks too. And they also have a lot of people with money to spend on it. Um, so my lab handles Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI primarily, and we split Quebec between us. The fee is $50. If that is an obstacle, 
um, email me, we'll find a way. Any other questions? Can you comment on who you give doxycycline to? Um, well, I don't give doxycycline to anyone because beca I'm a research scientist, not a physician or a pharmacist. Um, but in general, doxycycline is the standard antibiotic used to treat early Lyme disease. So if you catch the tick, um, the bacteria hasn't been around there that long. So uh, in Nova Scotia for a while, and now recently in New Brunswick, uh, pharmacists can pr prescribe a single dose of doxycycline. That is supposed to work if you get it uh, within the first day or two. So if you find the tick and the tick hasn't been feeding for very long, that should work, uh, just a, sh a short dose. Um, if it's been the tick has been feeding for a longer period of time. It's going to be 10 to 30 days of doxycycline, and you're probably going to need a physician to prescribe that. Um, that's given to everyone unless they have an allergy to doxycycline. Some people don't like to give it to children because it can uh, cause staining of the teeth, but now the advice on that subject has been reversed. So basically anyone who isn't allergic. Wondering that if I find a tick, I pull it off effectively, I put it in my baggie and I show up at the hospital, will I be given an antibiotic or will they say, oh, your chances are slim? <laughs> um, it depends on who you get in which hospital and how quickly you can get to see someone. Um, if you've got a knowledgeable pharmacist, the waiting period is shorter. Uh, some people like to go to their family doctor if they've got one and can access them. So, um, yeah, it really a lot depends on your individual circumstances and your access to health care. Sorry. Standard practice that you show up somewhere and say, I have this tick that they would automatically... Um, or would they send you away? And I said something, I'll get a tick. Um, I had a tick in the spring. I took the tick off, called my doctor, went to the doctor, he examined it, said, yes, it's black legged tick. It was a wart. And he gave me a prescription for antibiotics. And he said that now, for, he's now treating them as if they're all positive, even though they're not. He doesn't question, he just gives the antibiotics. 50% and so they treat them as if they are small. He treats them all positive. He, he also lectures on at the Dalhousie Medical School on. So he's very aware. Yeah, so he's kind of on the leading edge of doctors, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's excellent. I'm so happy to hear that. We had another question in the back. So if you've got a tick, you take the tick off, you want to send it to your lab to find out if it's infected or not, what are the steps? Do you put in a baggie? What's the address? Um, so take the stick tick off, put it in a Ziploc baggie, throw it in the freezer because a dead tick is a good tick. Um, uh, you fill out a form because it's Canada and we do nothing without forms, sorry. Uh, so you go to genetics.ca, you say you're in Atlantic Canada. Um, they helpfully take some money from you through your credit card. They provide you with a number and the address, you put that address on an envelope, shove the tick in there, put a stamp on it, send it to the lab and we'll test within, unless you can pay more to get it done faster. Don't Yes, we make money from that, but it's not worth it. We'll test with as quickly as we can when we get the tick. Paying more money to get it done super fast doesn't actually make any difference. So it'll take us up to three days, one to three days from when we get the tick. 
and then you get the results back by email. Oh, plus you get a beautiful picture of your personal tick suitable for framing. Sorry. And that they were talking about spraying in uh, certain areas over the winter before they hatched again. Do you know anything about that? I, I'm sorry, I need someone closer to the microphone. Sure. So um, there was research that there is oil in fir trees. Yes. And, and they were suggesting, you were saying, spraying over the winter. Yeah, so that's ball, that's really nice work with uh, out of a lab at Dalhousie. It's uh, the balsam fir oil. Now, those studies were done in the lab, so that's not the same as the real world. Um, and it, it will kill the tick on contact. And it certainly can't hurt. The problem is that if you spray the ground and the tick is a couple centimeters under the ground, the spray won't touch them. On the other hand, it's a natural product. It smells half decent, very Christmassy, obviously. Um, so if if you're in an area where ticks are a problem in your local area, uh, spraying that is not a bad idea. The other sprays available, there's... Uh, another natural product based on oregano oil, uh, which is sprayed locally, and garlic oil also sprayed locally, uh, and your backyard will smell either like a spaghetti dish. Uh, I must be hungry, I didn't have dinner yet. Um, so yeah, you you depending how your neighbors feel about garlic, they may either come over for dinner or they'll hate you. Uh, the permethrins or perethrins are unscented. So you do have options for local spraying. Nothing is going to be a a hundred percent in the real world. A hundred percent just doesn't work very well. Well, I think we we can wrap it up here. And if you have questions for uh, for vet after the meeting. Um, uh, will, will it be okay to email you? Absolutely. All Love right. Talking about ticks. That's great. Well, I really want to thank you. It, it really was revolting. I, I have to admit, um, but your delivery is, is excellent. And thank you at least ending, um, your talk with some options that are available to us. Um, I am wondering, is it worth you know, doing like a tick sweep in your yard to see what kind of a population you have there or? Um, the ticks are generally, are better at finding us than we are at finding them. And the reason is if you're doing a sweep, the thing you're sweeping with is not sweating. It doesn't smell like you. It's not emitting carbon dioxide. So if you are finding ticks in a sweep, that means your yard is crawling with them and you need to deal with it because it isn't safe to be out there. That's a personal opinion, but if you can find a tick in a sweep, there is a serious problem because they're all the ticks you're not finding. Wow. On the other hand, if you do a sweep, tick sweep in your yard and you're finding tons of ticks, please let me know because we'd be really excited because we can always use them for experiments. On the other hand, you'd be even better calling it a pest control company and getting your yard treated. Oh, well, that's interesting. So you can get pest control companies to to spray for the yeah, tick? They'll, yeah, they will do uh, local spraying um, and it's uh It's not ecologically wonderful. But as long as it doesn't get into the waterways, and you do have to balance that with your own personal risk. Right. Well, thank you so much, Vet. Uh, it's really, um, your talk was just full of so much interesting information. And, uh, and I thank you for coming back to speak to the club again. It just speaks to um, 
how interested and concerned people are about ticks right now. So thank you very much for that. Well, and thank you very much for the invitation. And now I'm going to go have dinner. <laughs> you haven't made us hungry, I must say. <laughs> but thanks. And before everybody signs off, um, I'd just like to remind you that October 19th um, is our next monthly meeting, and it will be held at the Rockwood Park Interpretation Center at 7 o'clock. And uh, if we don't see you at one of the outings before that, we will uh, see you at the meeting. So thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful night.